record if the you know live stream fails so people can still watch it later and i will click broadcast okay so hi myself Kleine Musik. Should I keep going? I don't think we're streaming yet, right? We are on the webinar now. Oh, we are. We are, and I think that we're mostly going to be broadcasting out to people on Facebook and on YouTube um, for this conversation. So we should probably begin. Um, I just want to start by introducing myself. I'm Tom Llewellyn with Shareable.net, and we're really proud to be partnering with the Global Summit on the next three programs that we're going to be having for the next uh, few hours. Um, it's going to start with the session that we're in right now, um, which is going to be focusing on the work that reconnects and uh, more specifically around um, the concept of from grieving to healing. Um, from there, we, we will be transitioning into a session, um, which will be uh, a really deeply interactive conversation, a fishbowl um, being led by Bob Stilger of New Stories, um, which is really focused on uh, cultivating resilience. And we're going to kind of get into some deep work with that. And then it, we will be capped off this um, at the end with a special screening of a film that I produced and narrated called The Response, How Puerto Ricans Are Restoring Power to the People about how the people of Puerto Rico came together after Hurricane Maria to build uh, permanent re resilience infrastructure and build community power. Um, so with that, I'm really proud to hand the conversation um, that we're about to engage into right now over to Lydia Violet, um, who will do a little bit of an introduction of what we're gonna be getting into right now. Thanks, Tom. Um, welcome folks to this session with me and Tabitha. Um, 
just to give you a little orientation, it's so common to either have been in awareness about struggle that's happened in the world your whole life or just waking up to it to be overwhelmed, overwhelmed with the um, emotionally, with despair or paralysis or all the kind of myriad of ways that that overwhelm can show itself. And what we're gonna explore in this session is um, lessons from, I mean, for me, I'm speaking from lessons from facilitating Joanna's work for about the past 10 years. And I know Tabitha's very immersed and experienced in her path. And yeah, we're just gonna be hopefully sharing some resources around being in the world right now, about finding your pulse in the world right now, finding your community, finding the liberation of your energy for action and how grief and healing can contribute to that. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Tabitha. Thanks, Lydia. I am honored and so excited to be with, in, on here with you. Um, and so we're both gonna be learning from each other and just sharing and jumping in and out. It's not going to be a lecture. If you came for a lecture, it's not it. We're just gonna be in conversation together. But speaking of Pulse that you were talking about, Lydia, I, we thought it would be wonderful to just start with that. Just bring in our presence. We, we know that the audience is in all over the world. So some of you have just ended your work day and you are stressed. Some of you are putting kids to bed. Others are just waking up and your mind is still not really here yet. So we're just gonna come into our bodies just taking three cleansing breaths. So just take this minute wherever you are, if you're still in bed and you really wanna be part of this healing conversation, just feel your feet on the ground. Or if you're laying, just make that contact and bring your awareness to that. And if you're sitting on the chair, laying down, just feel being supported by that chair where your body touches the cushion, all the mattress, all the floor, wherever you are, and your back. And just take a minute and feel that support. And bring your awareness to your breath. That breath that keeps going, but rarely do we come back to it. So if you're able to just put your hands on your stomach, so you can tell that you do, you're breathing. If you breathe in, your hands should be able to raise. That's how you will know you're taking a deep a breath from your diaphragm. So breathe with me. We will hold and count to three, then breathe out real slow as we count to three. So just three breaths together. So breathe in, one, two, three. Hold, one, two, three, and breathe out. One, two, three. If you're comfortable, close your eyes like I'm doing. If not, just put your gaze on the floor and let's take another breath. Hold and out. And for this last one, really let it out through your mouth and just let everything go and really come and be present with us. So breathe in, hold and let it all out through your mouth. And just open your eyes slowly and welcome. So I'll hand it back to Lydia to start us off in that conversation to grief and healing. Take it mm -hmm. away. I haven't done that yet today. Right? No, I was just like, okay, I can create even just a little bit of space which is really helpful for functioning in the world. And I'm going to, I'm going to share some things on top of that. I want, don't be afraid to like, be like, Oh yeah, I have thoughts about that. Like, just feel free. Like this can be super casual like that. Just come on in. Um, so my name is Lydia and I'm in the United States. I live in Berkeley, California on unceded Ohlone territory. And I primarily have, um, worked in North America and Europe, and then a little bit in Central America. And, you know, what's pertinent to this conversation today is I have studied with Joanna Macy, who's an elder who, um, along with others, kind of started really speaking to 
what might be an unacknowledged despair or burnout. You know, she first wrote about it 45 years ago that activists, but eventually far more than just activists can feel um, by being alive and aware of what's, what's happened and what is happening to the planet. That, that awareness comes with a, cer a certain emotional body of reactions. And um, that if we, and Joanna really started this body of work that's a combination of teachings and group exercises from her own influences around how we can metabolize that, how we can speak honestly and come out of isolation in a group and speak honestly about how we're doing and what I have noticed time and time again in my last 10 years of facilitating and I've done a, a couple hundred workshops you know so whatever that means just that I have some experience and I've observed some patterns is that that despair isn't an endpoint it's not a period at the end of a sentence in fact it's this arrow that shoots us into what we deeply care about and is on behalf of an intelligent, connected reaction to an ecosystem that we're inherently connected to. So it's very understandable for us to have that reaction. So what I'm speaking to today is just from observing, talking to lots of people and doing the work myself. And then I'm also a musician and I, you know, believe in community for, or music for community resilience and community healing. And so, there are so many traditions of that. I mean, in the United States, just the black gospel tradition and protest movement tradition, there um, is so much uh, to humbly learn and acknowledge of the power of music to be able to hold our souls in difficult times. Um, <laughs> I just see you nodding, Tabitha, and that makes me feel good. Like, I'm like, all right, we on something, we gotta go now. <laughs> Yes, I forgot I muted myself. Yes, I just, music is how, and because the part I want to talk about is intergenerational healing and intergenerational grief uh -huh. and how that affects us. And part of that from even my people, the African continent and all the way to African Americans, music has been our, our way of healing. And it's, so when you were saying that, I'm like, yes, we need more musicians yeah. and more community. We heal in community, a lot of our cultures, so. That's why I'm, I'm shaking my head because I'm like, yes. Yeah. Right. You just said we heal in community and how, so the way at least, you know, I grew up in the States and so I grew up in a kind of cultural soup that told me certain things about pain. And the primary story that I was given is it's to be handled by myself <laughs> and to stay in my room and not come out until it's gone. And that the goal is to make it go away as fast as possible. And it's a sign of weakness, you know, it's a sign of, it's a hindrance. And when I think we grow up, you know, I, me and others who have grown up in that kind of a culture, we don't learn tools. We don't learn context of the purpose of empathic pain. Mm. Why we feel the things that we feel when we witness and encounter suffering in the world. And if there's anything I've learned from the work that reconnects, if there's anything I've learned from supporting folks and my own journey is that my pain for the wor world arises because I care about what happens to people and I care about what happens to my community and that there's dignity in that. Mm. There's grace in that. There's wisdom in that. And just like you're saying, what can it look like to come instead of pushing it down and being like, no, I'm good, I'm good. And going home and paralyzing for eight hours on Facebook every day, which is so common now, you know, or just paralyzing in the different ways we can hide. Right. I care about what's happening. I'm overwhelmed that it's okay to say I'm overwhelmed. I need tools for how to be with all of this that that is a symptom of integrity, of dignity. Yes. <laughs> yeah. like, you're just 
touching on all of this. I'm getting excited. So now I, I am tempted to jump into an interviewer, interviewer kind of chair so that um, those who are listening, because it's resonating because that we do the same work. Obviously, that's why we're both here. So now I am understanding exactly what you're saying. And I <laughs> start asking you questions so you go deeper on what you're saying. Hmm. What kind of tools? One, I love how you're saying the messages we've been given. And don't be deceived by the um, me saying we heal in community. Even communal, especially actually even more so communal or collectivistic cultures. We do a lot of things in community. Mm -hmm. African cultures, Asian cultures, a lot of them are very collectivistic and you look out for each other. But when it comes to pain and suffering, it's still very personal. And you are still, my culture, you're supposed to keep it together. And there are all those messages that go along with the different identities we have. As a woman, what does that mean? As a man, what does that mean? If you're older or younger child, what does that mean for you and how you handle your pain? And what does society, right? So all the messages we've received along the way on what we do with that, which is what you touched on so well. You said, and nobody gives you the tools. So we all go through this life. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it, you've heard that book of the body keeps the score. Yeah, I haven't read all of it yet, but I'm in process. I like for five years. <laughs> right? <laughs> I am. I have so many. <laughs> but I yeah, hear you. I'm, into it. I'm into it. I hear you. So I wanted to ask, I'm saying all of this, like we all know when we feel it, sometimes people don't have the language. And a lot of people when not in this work or not actively pursuing it, will never know what the tools are unless they're in crisis. So right. what kind of tools have you been given or do you give others? So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll speak specifically too from the work that reconnects this body of work, but I also wanna acknowledge that there's so many different people who are teaching and facilitating how to build emotional capacity, how to build, you know, capacity for, and, and a respect of difficult emotions. Mm. Um, but, you know, some of the tools, I mean, the first thing that we do in the work that reconnects is we come together. So we come out of isolation. And the trajectory of the workshop is interesting because there tends to be this roadmap that we follow that seems to be helpful for the process of tending to our pain for the world. And it's called the spiral of the work that reconnects. And it's interesting because the first place that we start and I remember I was so ready. I was like, all right, where do we start? What's the juicy new thing I'm going to learn? The first place that we start is gratitude. Mm -hmm. And I remember when Joanna said that, I was like, what? I know about gratitude. What is that I'm thing? Like, <laughs> you know, but she said, look, when you live in a political economy that wants you to feel needy and insufficient, so you buy things to practice gratitude, to take stock of what you have around you, with you, the resources that you have within you is a subversive political act and fundamental for remedying the toxicity of capitalist culture and the effect that it has on us psychologically when it comes to just not having that practice that that felt sense and it can sound you know counteractive but gratitude is this resourcing lifeline to start with and so many wisdom traditions so many cultures know knew this they say first you give thanks first you allow yourself to open into awe and wonder that you're here at all that we that we are here at all that a tree is a tree that an elephant is an elephant, that the stars are stars. First, we start there. And then we come together and allow ourselves to speak honestly, and we respect each other's truth speaking. And in the work that reconnects, we have different exercises to hold the way that we do this. So we have something called a truth mandala, which is a very, very simple grief ritual where we simply put natural objects in the center of the circle and we make space for each other to walk in and say what we need to say. And we believe each other. 
you know, we have different exercises where somebody, you know, through their imagination reflects from the imagined perspective of a human from seven generations in the future, from an ancestor, from the more than human world. So there's a lot of imagination that comes in. Wow. There, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's dope. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> my gratitude, I think uh, one of the things that uh, have affected us, almost all of us, at the core of all our pain, especially in these Western countries, is that lack of, that sense of lack, right? We're always feeling like we're not enough. That not enoughness that as a person, in terms of what you have, we're always comparing and social media and all of that. And what you said about gratitude, gratitude turns what we have into enough. And it I love that. Go yeah, it, it resources us psychologically. And when it comes to solidarity work, I think it's invaluable for us to understand what our lives bring with us. So that as we tend to suffering in the world, we understand what we have access to to bring to the table. We mm -hmm. understand the gifts we bring to the ecosystems we're a part of. It's not, to me, it's not selfish to know what you're good at. I mean, you don't want to get a hot, you know, you don't want to get egotistical about it, but we all exist in ecosystems and there's suffering and oppression and um, environmental degradation. And I think part of the way that we show up is by knowing what we have a knack for. What role do we hold in the ecosystem of healing that we want to be a part of? Hmm. And so we do, sometimes we do exercises in the work that reconnects. That's like, you know, we have these things called open sentences. It's really simple. I just prompt you and you just speak on from there. And that's I might, fun. yeah. Oh, <laughs> you just say like, this is, I warm people up first. Some things I okay. love about being alive in earth. Some things we do that first. And then the last one I go is some things I appreciate about myself are. Hmm. That so Tabitha. What's one, thing you, what's one thing you appreciate about yourself? No, I'm going to regret saying, let's try it. <laughs> oh. I'm like, oh, okay. Appreciate about myself. I am social. I can easily get along with anyone. Mm. I appreciate that I can let myself be vulnerable. Mm. And like, like right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Surprise. I'm not doing this. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw this back at you and everybody who's watching yeah, please back do at me. everybody else do, everybody this do it do I, it yes so we can't see you all but y'all can see us so try this if you can write it down if you're by yourself lady what do you oh what do you appreciate about yourself um i appreciate that i i also am like i can get along with a lot of different kinds of people and i appreciate that i can somewhat sing and wherever I am, I can bring music in if that could be helpful. Girl, you can sing. Don't, don't, uh, don't minimize that. <laughs> I just heard you. We all heard you. So. <laughs> there it is. What we even minimize what we bring to the table. Right. Yes. But see, it's interesting. We're talking about grief and healing. And here we are talking about what we appreciate about, about ourselves. Because I think the pain that we can feel is because we want things to be healed, which means we want medicine to come to the table. And we can't, this is the thing. We can't know accurate medicine if we don't know the wound. And if we can't manage our own empathic pain, we can't stay with the wound long enough to understand it. Or I don't want to say like universally, but usually if we can't be with the suffering, if we have to turn away from, from it, we can't understand what's needed. And we might be part of that equation or, you know, what's so common right now is it's coming from a thousand different directions. And the interesting thing is that can make people feel even more alone. But again, that's because I don't think we are conditioned to understand that we are part, the majority of the people we are in collaboration with, we will never meet. Mm. but we're in collaboration with them. 
millions and millions of people and the more than human world. And all I need to do is find my torch. I don't have to solve everything. That would be very egotistical of me and not, you know, what I need to do is find my torch and contribute it to the ecosystem of healing. And you might say, you know, well, what if it all goes, what if it all goes? What if everything dies and, you know, a few rich people live on the planet, we all go or everything. And I would say, yeah, I can see that as a possibility. Mm -hmm. I can also see a thousand different possibilities and that from this vantage point, I can't tell you what's going to happen. But what I do know about living in that kind of uncertainty, when I don't know what's going to happen, is that it, liber it can liberate my truest intention independent of outcome. I don't know what's going to happen, so what do I want to do anyway? What do I want to pledge myself to with my days? Mm -hmm. Lydia, me, I want to pledge myself to kindness, to growth, to understanding things. I have a voracious appetite for understanding, for music, for culture, for uplifting people. No matter what happens, that's what I'm here to do. So that makes me wonder what brought you to this work? What lights that fire, that <laughs> empathic presence and fierceness to changing and doing the work that you do? Well, I'm about, I'm going to ask you the same question after. So let's both answer <laughs> this. I'll what? answer it and you Go answer too about what brought you and, and some about your work. Um, I have to say, like, I first met Joanna in grad school. And I, I applied to this program called the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness Program at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And so I apply to this program, I get in, and I'm going to school, and I realize first week of school, I have no idea what we're going to talk about. And I worry, I, I'm like, have I made a big mistake? I don't know what we're going to do. And one of my first classes with, with, was with Joanna Macy. And simply what happened that day was she introduced the class and she named our pain for the world. And no one had ever named it for me before. And I realized it had been misdefined my whole life. You're too sensitive. You're sorry, there's a motorcycle going by. I didn't want to put on my headphones. You're too sensitive, care too much about other people, blah, blah, blah whatever. And she helped me understand that that was an, it's an absolutely precious part of my being. And I think I just kind of stuck around Joanna for a while and eventually it became clear to me that I, you know, really wanted to, that part, this work was part of my work, was helping people in this very vulnerable, but very potent, very beautiful place that just means you care about what happens to people and that acknowledging it and finding tools around it can lead to, you know, I know the session is called from grief to healing. I would say grief and healing. And. I don't know that the grief being alive right now, I don't know that it goes away, but I Change. do think, yeah. So mm -hmm. you, now you, you, what, why, why, what brought you to do the work that you do? Um, yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> we don't have the time for all of that, but I think the my defining moment where I always knew this was my work um, is was to heal the minds. In the first time, I was in tenth grade. I had just moved to the U.S. from Rwanda, fourteen year old, I think. Um, and I learned about this whole thing called psychology where you can heal the world. So those who know anything about Rwanda, we went through a genocide and people lost over a million people in less than a month were killed, all of it. I said, wow, whatever this thing is, that's what I want to do. That I could go back to Rwanda and change and help people because nobody talks about anything. Mm -hmm. What we started out with, you're supposed to just push that somewhere and keep showing up just keep moving on but 
we, as we know, trauma always manifests. It doesn't matter how far, how deep you feel, especially, um, anyway, I won't get into that. So that was my initial thing. Fast forward, I go to school for this, graduate um, my grad school, go back to one and work with the, this population, uh, go through life as life comes, lose my mom uh, to a car accident, you know, so all these different traumatic experiences and grief, which I remember on my mom's funeral, a Rwandan woman taking me to the side and she, she, I was crying, um, I guess the ugly cry, and she <laughs> says nicely, can you take that somewhere else? Because it was uncomfortable for, and usually it's about us. It's not about the person right. expressing, right? We're like, it's uncomfortable for me to watch you cry or it's not ladylike, it's whatever that is. Um, but the real defining moment for me was 2015. I went to Uganda uh, with my then husband who had started a nonprofit. Um, and they do a wonderful job, holistic approach, educating kids and all everything, but they didn't have mental health as part of this. And mm -hmm. so I show up there because I say, obviously there's a lot of grief here because the whole generation was wiped out with HIV AIDS in the eighties in sub-Saharan Africa. And now grandmothers are raising their grandkids with little to nothing in their poverty. Um, and so I wanted to see what, what can I do? And then we asked the teachers, what, what, what do you think is most um, needed in this community? And the teacher very nonchalantly says, well, there is this nine-year-old in class who was raped yesterday. Um, and mm. she's in class like nothing happened. Everybody knew this and life went on because mm. she was poor. And the message, back to messages that we get, she's a girl. So sooner or later, she's getting married off and the perpetrator offered a goat as an apology to her guardian. Mm -hmm. And to me it was another message telling this girl, you're worth a goat. And so I can't even imagine the pain around just that one little girl. For right. her sons, the grandmother, the helplessness and the lack of tools you're talking about and the lack of community and space to even just validate what that pain is and how to begin that healing. So anyway, I bring her out, we talk, I do a little therapy with her, whatever. We move on the next day, another girl hears about it, comes forward. Third day, another girl hears about this other girl comes forward while mm -hmm. I'm still in the village, back to back. So I don't believe in coincidences, but I'll, I'll get straight to my aha moment. And the, um, the third girl who came forward was five years old and her perpetrator was her grandfather who was HIV positive and they couldn't get $5 in a span of 72 hours to get a pill that could have saved her life. Mm. So the, the pain is, we can never compare pain, right? Everybody is so different and nobody's, nobody's pain is worse than the other person's pain and needs are, anyway, so there's, it was just too much. Um, so as I'm processing that, and it takes me a while usually because I, I do well in crisis. Then afterwards, I start processing my own stuff. And it clicked for me. I am a survivor of sexual assault when I was a child. And I had never talked about it. Back to just keep it over there and you work it out. So I went into this work trying to heal the world, women, the girls, be a voice. But I was ignoring the 11-year-old me. Right. who was still inside screaming for this help. And what came to me while I was processing this nine-year-old's pain that I carried everything with me back to Michigan, it was clear, it says, well, either you are a hypocrite, that you don't want to do the hard work you know it takes to start your healing journey, or, what you, or you don't think you deserve the healing you're offering the world. Mm. And either way, for me, that was none of those options were good enough. So that's my, that's my why, right? Every day is to show up in part of the vulnerability that I'm working through and breaking the cycles, the intergenerational cycles. Because later on, I realized my mom went through the same thing. She never talked about it. 
Yeah. Women, you know, one in every one in three women have gone through this in different parts, but yes. So that's kind of yeah. my why. It's start with speaking up. And that's why music, right? Helps some people, gives us a voice that we couldn't have used otherwise. It's and, the magical thing. I mean, I just want to honor that. I mean, first of all, your story is such a, like, if we don't talk about the pain and we don't, if we don't learn how to be with our own empathic pain, we don't get to actually hear the needs of the people. And that I see in that moment where you were asked that question and then you started down the work that you're, I saw you as like joining this great ecosystem of healers, you know, like you took your place and that you have all those people with you and at your back and that that's part of what the story that we don't get to inherit a lot of the times when our pain wants to inspire us to do something for something to understand that that pain is holy mm. Mm. it's holy thing for you to go okay is this where I have something to offer in my life? Because it's where I've been. And I'm willing to see this and willing to, I'm willing to come out of my isolation. Yeah. And join, and join in solidarity with, with this. And then when you do that, how you join in solidarity with so much more than even just those people that you're helping, even if that's everything. Yeah. Yeah, there's strength in numbers. And that's what unprocessed grief does. Isolates you, makes you feel, pulls up a wall, which you, most of us, yeah, we think it's protecting us from more pain coming outside, but it's also keeping us in. So we can't. That's why I try people. There's no shame in your pain for the world. There's glorious beauty in you giving a damn about what happens to people, what happens to the environment. Your moral compass is awake and alive. That's good news. Yes. So now we need tools. Okay, let me learn. Like we are we are also you know i can learn some tools but we are in the process of learning even more how to build the emotional muscle to be alive right now when do i need a break when do i need to like lay down because i have some compassion fatigue and then how can i show up again there's one other teaching from the work that reconnects i wanted to bring in before we close yeah. um, and it has to do with what Joanna calls the three dimensions of the great turning. And it's in, a, it's in essence saying it's a longer teaching. And I love the teachings part of Joanna's work because I love the brain food. It helps orient me. Mm -hmm. But essentially, many people think of activism in a very narrow sliver of actions. And the three dimensions of the great turning really broadened that for me. Mm. Um, and so the first dimension of it is called holding actions. And that is anything that slows down destruction. It slows down destruction and buys time. It can be in courts, you're getting injunctions. It can be boycotts and economic, you know, trying to slow things down economically. There's a variety of ways, but there's also two other dimensions. And so one is called new and remembered Gaian systems. You can use any words you want. It's really just as you slow down destruction, how can we organize life to support life? And Paul Hawken talks about the blessed unrest that there's never been a time where so many people are organizing to support life in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. The biggest decentralized revolution the species has seen. Wow whether it's ways of organizing food or water or education or, right, we slow down destruction and we try and figure out how to organize life to support life. And the third dimension, which is the one that I think people can doubt the most, is that holding actions and regenerative systems, they don't take hold without shifts in consciousness. Mm 
Mm. Yes. But there's no shifts in consciousness is where we act out of. And the people who nourish shifts in consciousness, therapists, educators, artists, musicians, dancers, people who tell new stories for us to step into together, who help us imagine possibilities we didn't know. And that all of those go into activism or into the ecosystem of healing that's alive on the planet. And maybe the last thing I wanna say is that, you know, grief is an incredibly respectable emotion. And like I've said, it has such a wealth of morality and love in it. And I think that, of course, we need support in how to process it. And we're also giving birth to in this time, how to give, how to hold what is happening in our communities and in our world. And that through the grief, we find a kind of honesty that can inform the integrity of the future. Many things can inform the, the integrity of the future. And I think grief is one of them. So is imagining possibilities. So is sci-fi futurism. So is learning how to plant food. So is, I mean, all those, it's an eco that, you know, like it's this whole, um, so that's, yeah, that's kind of what I, that's what I think. I see Mark on here. I'm Mark. Part of cultivating our human self. Yes. Bringing artists with scientists, climate activists, and marine experts to explore the climate crisis. Multiple ecosystems of experience and intelligence. It is all connected. We, are, we cannot heal one while hurting another and think there's going to be that shift. Right? So we just everything is interconnected. And I do realize that we are the 840 out, uh, right? Was that the, the time? 845. It was 845. Yeah. Out, out, sure. So yes, during this, what you were just talking about, I think um, one of the things that COVID has done is make everybody just stay with their stuff. Mm. And a lot of people in Western, I can't generalize, I don't know much about every, all cultures, but a lot of us have been just moving really fast, not caring what we take down with us, including ourselves, each other, uh, climate, right? And it felt that for the first time, we, people are forced to stay still with the pain. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm one mother nature literally renewed itself in front of our eyes the minute we stopped moving right we we saw in the news where um birds i mean even just in my own neighborhood i could see a difference from the Me first too. month right we all like why we have birds i can hear them now <laughs> so exactly so if we all just pay attention to that and just be able to show up for ourselves self-care is so key um so we know it is starting up in five minutes now yeah. some something else is starting in five minutes i think that those are going to be my my parting um mm -hmm. comments is my my favorite favorite um analogy that i use everywhere you've heard of the kintsugi art it's a japanese art form um from the 15th century where when a pot or a cup, something made out of clay would break, they'll get all the pieces and they let them sit for a while and they just let it sit. Then after they study it and they bring gold and they patch all the cracks with gold and they bring mm -hmm. it back together and it becomes even more beautiful than it was before. And it's mm -hmm. worth more because of the cracks that are now filled with gold. And so mm -hmm. some of us think that pain makes us broken, makes us ugly, makes us less than or not enough. But from that, you find that that gold, we are each other's gold. We can, when we patch it up, when we've gone through it and continually work in process, we are more beautiful. We'll make our world more beautiful. We just show up for ourselves and for each other. So, virtual hug. So let's go be the gold in this I world. You. And you and I have been in cahoots. We didn't even know each other until today. I 
I know. If people, are, if people are interested in exploring the work that reconnects with me, feel free to go to musicasmedicineproject.org. You can find a lot there. Wonderful. Yeah. Kintsuki. Yoko, nice meeting you, Lydia. And thank you all, everybody, whoever, whoever's out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for that great session uh, to you both. And and really, yeah, really appreciate everything you had to say. And I love that metaphor at the end. And 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 I'm going to I'm going to definitely think on that a little bit more. And, you know, a couple of things that were said earlier, the idea is, you know, practicing gratitude as a subversive political act. And, and that one's also really gonna, gonna stick with me. So, so thank you, Lydia. Um, thank you, Joanna, for those initial things yeah. which, which you channeled through Lydia. Thank you, Tabitha, for everything you had to say. Um, and we're gonna encourage people to move on to the next session. So I've put the, the, the link to that um, in the Zoom. We'll also go ahead and put the link to that in, the, in this Facebook Live um, and encourage people to join us over with, with Bob Stilger and a, and a whole host of other folks. Uh, talk about talking about cultivating resilience. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we just get out of here. Yeah, we're getting and. Uh...